Hello, and welcome to another episode of Inventor's Quick Tips. In this episode, we are going to cover four tips for writing claims. Now, I have to start with the warning of don't try this at home. Uh, you know that each video I have has a disclaimer, but for this, I feel it's necessary to also further point out that I don't recommend people write their own patent claims and file their own patent application. Uh, just to give an analogy, let's say you needed heart surgery. You probably wouldn't want to do your own heart surgery, but if you or someone you love is getting heart surgery, you probably still want to understand the basics of what the procedure entails. And that's my goal here, to give you some understanding. I believe that uh, your time is probably better spent working on your business and your technology. But I recognize that some inventors want to do it themselves, or they don't have the financial resources. And just because you don't have a lot of financial resources doesn't mean that you should give up on your idea. Good ideas come from everywhere. So if it was a choice between no patent at all or one that you write yourself, one that you write yourself may be better. But again, that's not what I recommend. And yes, that is Michael Jackson in the lower right on this uh, inventor collage. Uh, Michael Jackson is an inventor. I did a video on his patent, and I'll put a link to that in the description. Now, if you try to file your own patent application and uh, the claims uh, are not in good order, you'll get a letter something like this, which basically says, this patent application is a mess. You really should think about hiring someone. Um, if you write a patent application yourself and you don't get a letter from the patent office like this, then you probably wrote a decent patent application, at least from a format standpoint. Okay, so again, I don't recommend you do this, but we're just going to uh, show for informational purposes some of the important tips in writing a claim. And I have an acronym for it. DASA, D-A-S-A. -S Each letter stands for one of the four tips, so let's go through it. The first one is define the invention. Claims are supposed to define the invention, so we need to understand what it is. Next will be an adjective check. We'll check for adjectives in the claim, and we'll get into what to do about adjectives. Say what you mean. It can be harder than it sounds, and we'll give an example. And finally, antecedent basis refers to how terms are introduced in a claim. It's really more of a syntax or stylistic thing, but if you do a good job with this, it might help you avoid one of those you don't seem to know what you're doing letters from the patent office. So if we are going to define an invention, we need to have an invention to talk about. Let's start with our good friend, the pencil. Here is the pencil we all know and love with its little eraser on top. But there is a problem with the conventional eraser. It makes a mess. Look at all those crumbs. To solve it, I have invented a new eraser. It doesn't make a mess. It's an improved uh, eraser over the uh, existing eraser. And here's how it works. It has a special uh, resin-based eraser that's abrasive enough and so sticky, so it keeps the material stuck on the eraser, but abrasive enough to, you know, uh, peel away enough layers of paper to erase a mark. So where does the invention start? It's a metaphorical line between what is old and what we came up with, what's new. Here's the existing uh, pencil, you know, this is before our invention, and here is the invention. It's basically the new eraser on top of the pencil. And again, these aren't real claims. We're taking some simplifications and some shortcuts for the purposes of learning, so, uh, you know, we're skipping some details from what might be in a real uh, patent claim, but this is just to illustrate, so hopefully you uh, understand that. The claim should focus on the invention. So when I write a claim, it really needs to focus on the eraser part of it. So I might start with um, the pencil part, right? The pencil, an elongated body, and where in the eraser is fixed to the first end of the pencil. So this just describes what already exists. Now I have to add my inventive concept to it. When the eraser is comprised of an abrasive and somewhat sticky material, 
And that leads us to tip two, which is our adjective check, right? We've got some adjectives in here, and we should scrutinize them. It's not that we can't have an adjective and a claim, but when they're there, we should take a look at them and make sure we understand their purpose. So I uh, highlighted some here, abrasive and also yet soft. It's a little bit of a weird way to describe something in a claim, but again, this is just for illustration. Right, so when we have these adjectives, abrasive, soft, compared to what? Really, what we're trying to do here is answer the question, how will I know? How will I know if somebody's infringing my patent? How will I know if the other thing is abrasive as I've defined it, or soft as I've defined it? So we want to make sure when there's adjectives like this that we have some way to quantify it, either in the claims or at least in the written description. Uh, early on in my career, I remember having a discussion with a patent examiner where we were talking about the word flexible that was in one of the claims, and the examiner uh, reminded me that everything was flexible and went on to say that the Empire State Building was flexible, and if it wasn't, it would have surely toppled over in a strong storm. So he reminded me that... Uh, Anything can be anything, pretty much, if we don't put some definition behind it. So we can rely on some quantitative measures for many properties. So for example, uh, for abrasiveness, there is a, sci a couple scientific measures, such as the Mohs scale or the Tabor abrasion test. Similar for softness or almost any physical property, there is some way to measure it or quantify it. and so. Uh, if we're going to use adjectives, we should really at least try to understand the limits. And even if those limits aren't necessarily I in the claims, they're at least in the written description, which is used to support or help interpret claim terms during uh, the examination process and beyond. Another thing about this claim is um, that we are describing properties of the eraser, that it's abrasive and soft, but we're not really saying what it is. And while claims like this that describe properties exist and do get allowed sometimes, it's often good to have at least one claim that focuses on what the invention actually is. So here we are describing what the eraser is, what it is made out of. And especially with a mechanical invention, it can be good to have some claims focusing on what the structure is, rather than claiming properties or benefits. Now maybe we strayed a little bit from the check your adjectives, but as you can see, there is a lot of thought that can go into even a very simple invention, which is why I put up the don't try this at home warning at the beginning of this video. Tip number three is say what you mean. and. Uh, this little skit will help you to visualize it. So it's the last day of school, and Billy is trying to get out of the third grade. He has one more chance. If he gets this next question right, he moves on to fourth grade. Otherwise, he's got to repeat third grade. So the teacher asks, which numbers from 1 to 10 are divisible by 3? All right, come on, Billy. Don't mess this up. Let's see Billy's answer. All of them. Teacher says, sorry, Billy, that is incorrect. The correct answer is 3, 6, and 9. Looks like you'll be repeating third grade. Have a nice summer. I will see you in September. But the story doesn't end there. It turns out Billy had a good lawyer, and Billy's lawyer proved that, in fact, all the numbers are divisible by 3. Here we see what happens when 7 is divided by 3. And it certainly is divisible by 3. There's no question. But that's not what the teacher meant. Here's what the teacher meant. Which numbers from 1 to 10 result in an integer quotient with a divisor of 3? Basically, she was looking for which numbers uh, result in a quotient that doesn't have any decimals after it. It's just an integer. Now, uh, there have been numerous examples of real-life patents that ran into trouble due to a flaw like this. And one of my favorites is an example about a bread process where it talks about oven temperature versus air temperature. And I have a video on that. I'll put a link to that in the description. Basically, it's a bread patent fail. And uh, it's a short video, but uh, you may find it interesting. The last tip is uh, antecedent basis. So let's say we have a claim. We're sticking with the pencil theme again, and we introduce some things, 
some different terms, a wooden sleeve, a metal bracket, um, and a graphite rod, different stuff. And uh, the problem is that some of these terms we've introduced for the first time using the word the, which is incorrect as far as the U.S. Patent Office is concerned. So how do we fix this? We can rewrite the claim to introduce the terms uh, in the way that the U.S. Patent Office expects, which is with a a uh, or an rather than a the. And if we do that, if we rewrite it like this, then we've corrected those issues because now we introduce everything for the first time with an a uh, or an an. It's a pretty straightforward concept, but uh, it will make your claims look a lot more professional-like if you are writing your own patent application, if you uh, do your best to avoid these antecedent basis issues. I have a video that goes into a little more detail, and I will put a link to that in the description. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If so, please like, share, and subscribe. And once again, thanks for watching.